our final session today is a, is a, a real treat for those of you that are here. Um, we have two uh, industry leaders that are going to speak to you about some uh, trends that they're seeing in our industry, uh, talent and learning and HR and what's going on with measurement and analytics and big data. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Josh Burson, the founder uh, of uh, Burson & Associates, now Burson by Deloitte. And he'll share with you some of his thoughts on where we're going with big data in talent and learning in HR. Uh, the next speaker, uh, after Josh speaks for about 20 minutes, will be Brian Kropp of CEB. Brian is the managing director uh, of CEB HR practice, and he runs their corporate leadership council. And he'll talk additionally about some uh, research that they've done around some of uh, HR analytics and measurement and where we're going there. And then the remaining 20 minutes, we're actually going to open it up to the audience so that you guys can ask these experts your questions about what they think, which is really a cool thing because they have a lot of, of insights and information to provide. And by having a little bit more of an ad hoc session, we can really uh, get to the bottom of your questions. So uh, without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Josh Burson from Burson by Deloitte. Is this on? Great. <clears throat> is there a clicker? Oh, OK. Coming up. I know a lot of you, and I want to thank Jeff and Kent for inviting me here year after year after year. And somehow I keep getting invited back. Um, and hopefully that will continue on into the future as Knowledge Advisors evolves into a new home. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I originally had about an hour, but I'll talk for about 20 minutes about about big data and what's going on in HR. Um, I have the luxury of being part of a big, big company now and talk to many, many organizations about what they're doing in different areas of data and analytics. And I've come to some sort of interesting new perspectives on where learning measurement fits in the broader context. So that's really what I'm going to do is show you the broader context for about 20 minutes. And then we can talk later about questions. So the first is this idea, and I, I wrote a blog on this, of, of what I call datafication. And that is the sense that HR, like every, big, ever, every other process in business, is going to become data driven. Very slowly, it might take 10 years, but if you look at finance, if you look at marketing, if you look at it, uh, supply chain, you look at almost every other part of business, it's very, very data driven, whereas HR is not. And so we're at the beginning of a very exciting transition to um, use data in, in very profound new ways, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And of course, you know, you uh, as part of HR or maybe not in the HR function but maybe uh, aligned with HR, realize that the challenges that you face in the people side of the business are very, very big. Um, every one of the decisions that are made in HR, um, the people-related decisions, have very big implications. Who to hire, which is the biggest one. Who to promote. Who to give a high performance rating to why or how we send somebody to some training program, and what happens after that. Those are very big decisions from a business standpoint, from a CEO standpoint. And we're also always operating on gut feel and experience and judgment. And maybe there's a little bit of science behind it. But there's basically 80 to 90 percent of those decisions are still made based on, on somebody's um, guess. And so if we, can, if we can apply data to these things, and I'll show you, you know, a couple of examples, you can really transform the way companies work. Now, um, the question a lot of people ask is, you know, can HR do this? And, I, and I'm tired of reading this about this in the press, you know, oh, HR doesn't have enough data scientists and they're not enough analysts. The first thing I want to discuss is why I don't think that's true. And then, in fact, there's a very important sort of history to data in, inside of HR. <clears throat> we found, for example, that 14% of the companies we studied last year are fairly sophisticated, and I'll show you the model in a minute, and those companies are far outperforming their peers, and I will explain to you why that is. So how do they get there? Well, first of all, if you go back just a little bit of history, most of you uh, have heard of uh, Frederick Taylor, the guy that sort of tried to instrument iron workers around the 18, in the 1800s. Basically what he did is he was actually an industrial psychologist, he was a mechanical engineer, but he was basically the beginning of a data scientist, and he was measuring how much weight, how much iron you could carry on your back to move from the, you know, the smelter to the, whatever the equipment was, 
and what was the optimum amount of weight you could carry? And it turned out that 75 pounds was too much, but 56 pounds was the right amount. And he, you know, did all this time and motion studies. A lot of people think it's controversial, but he was essentially applying data to people productivity. And was actually, if you read this book, which is a really interesting book, you can, you can download it for free, he actually was a bit of a philosopher about how this data could be used for the betterment of, of people, of workers, not just for organizations. Then around World War I and early World War I, we had Carl Jung, who, who was actually a, a disciple of Freud, and he came up with the idea of types, that there are types of people. He didn't really know what they were, but there were personality types. Later that turned into Myers-Briggs, which is now one of the most widely used uh, assessments in the world. It's very controversial what it does, but it's very widely used. That was in the, you know, in the early 1900s. During World War I, we had to recruit a million people into the army. We had people coming in the United States coming out of the fields that had never picked up a gun coming into the army, learning how to, how to fire cannons. They had to be tested, so the concept of testing was created. Enormous amounts of scientific testing were done. From that, we did more analysis. AT&T and other companies used those tests to try to figure out how we could improve the operations and performance of people. And, you know, this is a, what I'm trying to get at here is this is not a new idea inside of HR using data. Um, we had testing centers. My wife had to actually went through one of these when she was back at Pacific Bell. We actually tried to scientifically diagnose based on your ability to deal with an inbox, how good a manager you're going to be. It's so silly when you think about it now, but that's actually what companies did. And that was all, all that data was stored in the corporate HR systems. And then, of course, we got computers. And computers took the data originally from the payroll systems like ADP and later um, and nobody really knew what they were going to do with all that data. And then later they realized, wow, you know, we actually have a lot of data about our employees. And if we look at it, we might actually be able to make some better decisions. And one of the first places that was applied was in the recruiting process, where we, you know, we had this enormous industry in the 1970s and 80s of applicant tracking systems. And nowadays you can't apply for a job without basically all of your information going into a database and getting scored, whether you like it or not, against a job description by some software. Um, and that's probably the most explosive area of, da of data analytics. And then, of course, now we have all the tools that analyze it. Um, you know, a four and a half, five billion dollar industry of talent management software. All of those companies, every single one of them, has very significant efforts to create more analytics tools for you at various different stages of maturity. And it's now in the public press. It's in the New York Times every week. Um, you know, it's it's in the Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, so here it is. And I don't think we have any choice within HR but just go with the flow. Um, and you know, so my, my initial message is there's this big wave of activity going on around you and in most cases, as I'll show you, your HR department isn't there yet and they're probably trying to figure out what the it is and how do they get there from here. <clears throat> so where are we? Um, so we did, last year we did, Karen O'Leonard, who was going to come up here with me, we asked her not to come today, and I did about a year and a half of research over the last two years. We, served, we did our typical approach, we did a big survey, we interviewed a bunch of companies, and we tried to figure out where companies were on this uh, sort of continuum of analytics. And we found, first of all, that the way to define, the way we define talent analytics is not better reporting out of the HRMS, um, it is really something different. It's taking the people data that you have, including the learning data and money, many of the other things that your organization has already collected, it's sitting out there in some system, and correlating it to business metrics and determining what is going on in your own company. Essentially doing machine learning types of activities to make better decisions about who to hire, who to promote, um, what's causing fraud, what's causing high sales numbers versus low sales numbers. So this is really you know, our, our de definition of what talent analytics is. And now if you look at where companies are on that continuum, we broke the data into four categories. The first we call reactive reporting. So the first thing that happens in an organization is uh, you know, somebody calls you up and says, you know, how many employees do I have and what's my average salary and what's my turnover rate and by the way give me a report of you know the last five years of salary increases and you know you're somebody back there and you know running a bunch of reports on Oracle or PeopleSoft trying to get that data out and that is what we call reactive reporting 56 of the companies that's all they're doing 
That's, and by the way, we tend to survey the more advanced companies, so it's probably more like 60 to 70 percent. We've been at eBay, we've been, to, we've been at all these big companies, and they have this mess of reporting. Lots and lots of reports coming out. Um, a funny story on that one, uh, one of the companies told us they send out you know, a weekly report on manage, manager uh, HR data to all the managers in the company. It's got all the statistics and measures you know, for their different departments. One week, uh, the report server was broken. They didn't send it out. Nobody called. <laughs> Nobody even looks at this stuff. I mean, managers don't have time. They're too busy running their groups, and when they need the data, they want it, but they certainly aren't going to read it. Just you know, They're not like us. They're not analysts, so they're going to read it when they need it. So that's you know, a good 60% of the market. The second is what we called, we characterized as proactive reporting. These are companies that have done enough work on their reporting infrastructure that they have dashboards, they have automation, they have a data dictionary, they have rationalized the sources of data to a large degree. They might have a data warehouse or might not, but the report, but they're, but they're, they've gotten ahead of the reporting problem. Okay, so that's a good 30%. Um, and uh, it turns out, as I'll show you in a minute, that's where the heavy lifting is, right here, is to get to this point. That's where 80 to 90 percent of the effort takes place. The third level in the model, and by the way, this is based on data, so there's you know six or seven hundred companies' data behind this, um, is what we call advanced analytics. This is where the company now has enough, there's probably an analytics team you as learning analytics would be part of that team. You would contribute to it. It's not, a, it's not 20 people. It's probably three to five people. They are now able to take the data that they've collected through stage one and stage two, and they are looking at it in different ways. And so they're usually ideally doing it one problem at a time. VP of sales comes in and says, how come we're not selling anything in this geography, but we're selling a ton in that geography? The team looks at the data, comes back and says, it's a training problem or it's a succession problem, or it's a turnover problem, or whatever they come up with, and I'll show you some examples of that, and they have enough access to the data that they can do that. That's about 10% that's about 10 of the companies are at that point, and those are the guys that you're starting to read about in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and some of these other magazines. And then there's the companies that have gotten ahead of that and actually captured enough data that they can predict what might happen next, and they've built uh, what are called back-tested scenarios where they can t say, okay, let's look at this little model we created over the last five years and see if it actually is valid. And so as we hire new people, we can predict their performance based on the history in the past. For example, Deloitte has a predictive analytics model for retention. Deloitte knows that if I get on too many airplanes and work on too many projects, if I get in a fight with Ricard and, you know, and something else goes wrong, then I'm a flight risk. And supposedly, they will tell my manager, you know, get them to tone it down or let them go, whatever, whatever they decide. But that's the kind of thing that happens. And, and only 4% of the companies we surveyed are at that point. So, you know, so that's a nice tool we have for you to sort of think through where you are. And you can assess yourself against that and, and, and sort of evaluate where you are. And it is based on data. We didn't just sort of dream this all up. Now, one of the things that comes up, though, when you look at it, is there's this chasm. There's this huge number of companies that are bogged down in reporting, and there's this small number of companies that are kind of doing analytics, the 14%. So what's that all about? What it really turns out, and, and you certainly know this if you've, if you've done a lot of analytics in learning, is that there's this huge effort that has to take place to get your data cleaned up and consolidated and rationalized and find it. And you find out that it's dirty. There's all sorts of HR data that's very dirty. And so, for example, the CHRO at Juniper, who I talked to about this, told me, he said, look, we wanted to do advanced analytics, but I knew it was going to take at least one to two years to clean up the data first. So I basically made a business case to the CEO, give me the money, give me the team, give me some help from IT, let me spend a year or two cleaning it up, and then I will come back to you with some incredible things. And he said, if I hadn't made that business case to do that first sort of ugly, dirty, you know, not very interesting work up front, I couldn't have gotten to that point. And, and that's what the data shows, is that the bulk of the effort does take place at level one and level two. When you get to level three and level four, the value goes way up, um, and you really don't see a lot of results. 
from and until you start doing more analysis. So unfortunately, now I, I actually come from a database background. I used to work for Sybase years ago, so I used to work with companies on this in general. It is a little bit of a backwater industry of people that know how to clean up and manage data, but the tools have gotten much, much better. And if you do happen to buy an integrated talent management system or consolidate the number of vendors you have, it's going to get even easier. So that's kind of the problem, is that a lot of these companies at level one and level two haven't figured out how to make the business case to get half a million dollars or a million dollars or whatever it takes to get themselves to a point where they can really use the data that they have. And, and I won't get into this, uh, but there's you know, a very traditional information management problem that HR has. It's the same problem that CRM and marketing had. It's the same problem that the supply chain guys had. It's the same problem of every other data part of your company. And uh, when I talk to a lot of, a lot of you folks and, and a lot of your organizations, a lot of what I try to, you know, to, to help you understand is this is a business case you have to make. Um, you can put it off for a few years, but if your competitor does it and they can source people better than you and they can figure out who the best candidates are and hire them away from you, you're going to be sorry. So there's an arms race here building up. And I think we're kind of in the early stages in HR. And it's, it's an exciting time. But, but it, it's going to be many years uh, of very, very exciting things happening. Now, one of the things, and I'll, I'll stop in a minute because I know we want to you know, uh, turn it over to Brian. Um, one of the things that I believe we have learned is that one of the things that holds companies back is the way that HR is organized. Now, most of you, because you're at this conference, are probably in an L&D function with an analytics role. Okay, So you're going to spend your days figuring out how to capture data and manage it about learning. And there's also somebody who's a comp analyst. And there's also somebody who's an engagement analyst. And there's also somebody looking at turnover. And there's somebody looking at payroll. And there's, you know, maybe there's a you know, few others. And they're usually not all in one place. And they're usually not on all in one team. So one of the things that we've seen as we talk to those companies at the 14%, the top ones, is that they have made another investment, is they have built a center of excellence around talent analytics. And they have made an investment to bring in a director level person to run it. Uh, they've hired a statistician, uh, or maybe they've brought them out of the I.O. group. And they have um, you know, spent some money with IT to consolidate them together. So I think at some point, if you're in an HR function, you guys, some of you are probably in HR, some of you aren't, um, you would want to be part of that. And you would want to contribute to that. And what happens is now everybody's working together, and you don't assume that learning is the only part of a problem, because it never is. I mean, learning is always a contributor to a problem or a solution, but it's never the only thing. And once you bring the data together, you can have some really fascinating insights. So let me, let me just spend a few minutes on that, and then I'll turn it over. I'm just about out of time. OK, so let me give you five really quick examples of how this kind of analytics can uh, transform a company. Um, so we would assume that people from top universities are high performers. We would assume that if you train people and give them compliance training, and we go through a lot of it at Deloitte, that you will not have loss and fraud. You would assume that if you increase customer service, you will increase client retention. You would assume that if we don't pay people enough, they're going to quit. And you would assume that if we do leadership development well in one place, it'll probably work well in other places. Those are traditional management assumptions that most managers would assume to be true. OK, on the first one, ADP certainly has proven this. I know uh, Carrie's had this experience. But the other company I was talking to about this did a statistical analysis of the high performer, high retention salespeople in their, their insurance company. They're a very blue blood Northeast insurance company. You have to go to top schools, get top grades to get in. Otherwise, you're not hired. They found that those guys or gals were not the high performing salespeople. Actually, the highest performing salespeople had a whole different set of characteristics. They did not necessarily have college degrees. They did not necessarily have good grades, but they were good at other things. I won't bother um, telling you what they are right now because we're a little short on time. They transformed their sourcing and recruiting and assessment process, generated about $4 million of incremental sales in the first year. Okay? So that's a you know, very common example. Example number two, Canadian Bank 
uh, was suffering from fraud in a lot of their branches. You know, money was disappearing here and there. They had done, you know, the training department. Of course, the initial reaction is we need to do more training. They do a bunch more training. The problem doesn't seem to go away. They collected a bunch of data. They looked at, you know, the relationship between fraud and a whole bunch of other characteristics. They found that the single most highly correlated factor in loss or fraud was the number of miles from the branch to the district manager. Because those were branches that were not getting visited by the district manager. Now it's obvious, but it wasn't obvious at the time. And if they hadn't looked at the data, they wouldn't have known that. And it was obviously a relatively easy problem to fix. But again, you know, gut feel didn't give them the right answer, but the data did. Okay? Third, food service company um, looks at looking at patterns of customer retention. You know, some customers stay for years, some customers, you know, drop their contracts. The assumption was always that it was a client service problem, so they monitored and measured and really, really focused on developing great levels of client service. Some, you know, some, some college kids came in, in over the summer, looked at a bunch of data and tried to correlate what was actually happening and found that the most highly correlated event that was causing a customer to drop their relationship was an OSHA safety violation. When somebody gets burned or slips and falls in one of their cafeterias, the first reaction for the client is, okay, you guys aren't the vendor we want to have. And they never thought about that. That was always a compliance problem or an insurance risk problem. They never thought of it a customer retention problem. They changed a bunch of business processes and now they're, they're managing their sales operation, much more focused on safety and training and, and compliance. Again, some of these things are really intuitively obvious after you do the analysis, but we're, we're operating on so much gut feel that we don't know until we do the analysis. And the final one is this one. I got two more and, I'll, and then I'll sit down. Um, this is a very large, very well-known company that has used the sort of uh, bell curve of performance management. If any of you have read my articles on why that's all a bad idea, and we can have a big conversation about it. I have a, a big following on that one. But um, they basically said, look, we're losing really top people. We're losing the, you know, the, the, the people who are rated number one, but the people that are rated two and three are staying. So let's look at why they're leaving. And they did some testing and they got some people from their research organization and they found that actually for the given amount of compensation they were paying across the company, this is a giant organization, they could pay the people at level two and level three 85% of market and they wouldn't leave. Because these are people that like working there and they really aren't there for the money anyway and they don't expect to become level ones. But that 15% had to go to the level ones and it would have a huge reduction in turnover. And so, of course, that went against, you know, the whole, the whole um, sort of process of equality that that company had used for compensation. And it, it, it basically makes an argument for, for doing away with the bell curve, but um, to change the way the compensation is structured. And they use that data as ammunition to go out and retrain leaders on why they need to give more money to the high performers, which they told me a year into it, they still can't get people to do it because there's such a culture of, of being equal on pay. That's a, that's a pretty significant, it's a huge company with a very significant finding. And the last one is this one. Um, it turns out that our research shows that leadership gaps are the number one problems that companies face around the world. It's going to come out in some research next week. Um, and so where we do, where we develop leaders, how we develop leaders, the succession, how we select them, what their job rotations are, are really critical decisions. Big oil company, very um, traditional company, has a very... Um, old-fashioned, well-ingrained model for leadership in the United States. You have to work in refining. You have to have, an, have, to have a master's in, in mechanical or uh, petroleum engineering. You have to have good grades. You, you have to be tall. Turned out we found out you have to be tall to get promoted in this company. Uh, we found out some interesting things when we looked at the data. But anyway, th they have this model. It sort of works in the United States. In China, it was an utter failure. They, they were having people leaving. They were not promoting people. They couldn't get people up the pipeline. So, uh, you know, they looked at it with Deloitte's help. They looked at a bunch of the data on who the high-performing leaders were in China, and they found out they had a completely different pattern, career pattern. They had had different kinds of jobs. They had different kinds of education. Uh, so they had worked, some of them had worked at, at they had more uh, business degrees and less engineering degrees. Uh, they had had different kinds of job rotations, and they, and, they were, and they statistically validated the model. They came back to the United States and said, you know what, maybe we need to change the way we do leadership development here, too. And if they hadn't looked at the data, they would have continued to try to push the U.S. model on China. So, so my, my point in this is that 
We have this, this huge opportunity around us to use data in a much, much more strategic way than ever before. You guys are sitting on one of the most valuable sources of data that organizations have, the data about training and learning and competencies. It will ultimately be one of the feeds you know, to a talent analytics system. And I think from a career standpoint, this will be one, maybe one of the most exciting things that you'll have an opportunity to participate in. OK, I might have gone a little bit over, but let me stop and turn it over to Brian. And do you want to take questions now? Or? All right, great. OK, so I'll sit down. Sure. <clears throat> Um, my name is Brian Kropp. I'm a managing director in CB's HR practice. You might have heard of the Corporate Leadership Council. You might get some emails from us, maybe from me sometimes. Um, you know, the, the, the analytics space is without a doubt one of the hottest spaces that is out there in terms of what people are interested in, what HR executives are focused on, what they care about, and so on. Uh, and what I want to share with you today is a little bit of work that we've done where we've been applying analytics to analytics, if you will. What are the things that actually make the best analytics functions better? What are they doing differently? How do they approach a problem differently? Do they set things up in a different way or not? So I'm going to share with you a couple of the ideas, a couple of lessons that we've learned, some examples from some of the companies that we've been able to profile here. And then we can talk about it a little bit after that. Sounds like a, a good way to spend 20 minutes or so. I'm glad you're nodding because I have no plan B, uh, to be honest. Um, so just a couple of things to share with folks. And do I need to be closer to the, to make it work? There we go. Um, first, data and probably things that you guys are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. A huge amount of pressure on HR functions to get more out of the um, data that we've got, the HR investments that we're making from a technology perspective. And what we find is that about 95% of companies are actually increasing their investment in the analytics space. Kind of curious as to the 5% that's not, but you know, almost everyone's focusing on that. But here's part of the problem. And the data that I'm going to share with you is from HR functions that we've been working with. We've also surveyed almost 10,000 line leaders that are consumers of that information when they're making talent decisions within their business. And also pulled together a lot of data that comes out of those organizations, either surveys or other systems that have got around engagement scores, performance outcomes, and turnover, and those sorts of things. But here's a really interesting data point for you. Only 15% of business leaders say that the information that I got from analytics from my HR function has actually led me to change a decision. What you see on the right is that um, most of the senior HR leaders, so the chief human resources officers and their direct reports largely agree. We're making a huge amount of investment here, but for the most part not getting a ton of return. And to Josh's point, these are probably a lot of companies that are on that level one, level two that are making a lot of investments but have yet to got, get to the point where they're getting a lot of value out of what that looks like. So we want to understand what's going on here. Um, what you see is a lot of really small logos. Um, but these are just the companies that we've worked with. So you can get a good sense of size, geographic scope, all those sorts of things. As a side note, uh, we actually work with about 2,600 organizations across the globe to understand issues like this. And this is just a set of the companies that we worked with to understand what was going on here. Oops. Um, so let me share with you one of the key things that we really found. And let me take a second to take apart the graph to explain it. So on the x-axis here, we're able to get a measure of how analytically sophisticated the companies are that we worked with. Not different in kind from what Josh was talking about in terms of the levels of maturity. Conceptually pretty similar. And what we wanted to look at, we actually were able then to get information from those companies about their retention rates, promotion rates, engagement levels, all those sorts of things. And what we find is that as companies are going from kind of a low level of sophistication to an average or medium level of sophistication, you actually see some nice returns that start to occur as organizations actually have data that they can share, information that they can share, start to get a better understanding of what's going on within their workforce. But here's what's interesting. For the organizations that got beyond kind of an average or basic level, what we actually started to see is that the improvement in talent outcomes that they were achieving tailed off, that you hit a point of diminishing marginal returns, that just becoming more sophisticated by itself wasn't enough to really drive the talent outcomes that are there. They were certainly better, but the rate of diminishing return really started to kick in at that point. So we want to try to figure out what was going on. Um, we've got 
including myself, a whole bunch of PhDs. We've got a huge team of folks that are able to look at the sorts of stuff. If you want to see kind of nerds in action, come to our office when we're doing these sorts of things. It'll be a, a lovely site for folks. Um, so we do a lot of regression analysis. We look at this data, combine it from a variety of different places, and put it together. If you've got questions about this, I can talk about it later. But my guess is this is perhaps not the most uh, valuable use of our time right now. Um, but here's what we find. That sophistication on the bottom is still the one that we saw from before. Left to right, left hand side less sophisticated, right hand side more sophisticated. We were actually able to pick out something different. That organizations that did a better job of applying the analytics that they were doing to solve real business problems actually got much better talent results. So the organizations that were more sophisticated analytically but also the ones that were better able to understand the business situation that the organization was facing it and apply it to those things got much better results. And when you do both, what you find is that those organizations had about 20% better talent outcomes, engagement levels, retention, which kind of averaged all that together. <clears throat> but what you find that's really interesting, if you compare the upper left-hand corner box, the high application, low sophistication, to the bottom right-hand one, the low application, high sophistication, if you're to just get better at one thing, it's how do we make sure that we're applying the analytics that we're doing to the problems and challenges that we're facing as an organization. To Josh's point, are we trying to solve a fraud problem? Are we trying to understand a customer retention problem, whatever it might be? That those questions and understanding that is actually more important than just becoming much more sophisticated in the analysis that you do. Another way to think about it, the most sophisticated analysis that act don't actually align to a business problem really don't drive the performance of the organization. But a less sophisticated type of analysis, on average, that applies to a problem that the organization is facing is more likely to generate a result. So the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we become more effective in terms of making that happen? Well, we actually found the organizations that were really good at this did three things differently. The thing about them is the criticality, the capability, and the credibility. First, uh, they were able to identify which business problems were the most important. They weren't simply reacting to what the business was asking them to do. They were able to look at the challenges that were there and proactively work with them on what they, were, what they need to get better at. Secondly, they got the HR function better in terms of actually using analysis and using data. And not just the analytics function here, but the entire HR function got better at this. And third, they just had much better credibility when they were working with the line. Uh, an interesting data point for you. Uh, only 18% of the senior leaders that we surveyed said they actually trust the data that they get from HR. There's only one function that was worse. Anybody want to guess what was worse than HR in terms of lack of trust of data from the corporate center? People trust IT data. They really trust finance data, marketing data. So if you're ever in a debate with someone and be like, you don't like our data, those marketing people, they're way worse. Right? Just shift the blame. Um, so let me talk to you about what companies are doing here. Uh, first, just a quick example from The Gap. Um, what was going on in The Gap is they have a variety of different brands, Old Navy, The Gap, Piperline, and, and so on. And they had a whole set of places where they're getting data from. And to Josh's point, this is one of those companies that was in that experience of being overwhelmed with all the information that's out there. So what did they do to solve this? They actually did three things that were really interesting. One, they actually went out to their customers to understand what sort of challenges each of their businesses were facing. And they broke it into each of the different business units that we were just looking at. So they had a set of questions. Are they able to rank, ask those leaders to rank order what their business problems were? Not what their HR needs were or what their data needs were, but what were the business challenges that they were facing? Secondly, they were then able to look across each of their different uh, business units to understand where there was a share challenge, which they had their centralized analytics team work on, versus what were the analytics that they're going to push into the business unit. So they're able to prioritize across different things. Third, then this let them build the roadmap for technology investments, analytic investments that they wanted to make. So they're making sure they were building it on the problems that the business felt was most important. We've got the full set of questions that they asked, the full set of 100. We've had a lot of organizations actually take these questions, ask their own business leaders what that looks like to figure out how to allocate their own investments in this particular space. So the first one is, how do we make sure that we're focusing on the things that are most critical to the business to make it successful? A second, as we think about the, the, the data that we've got, I shared with this with you just a minute ago about the, the lack of trust that we see. 
really interesting data point for you. When you've got business leaders that actually trust the data and the insights that they have, the impact, the benefit you get out of your analytics is about 14% higher when it comes to driving the talent outcomes of the organization. So a huge problem that needs to be solved. And one of the things that we found that's really critical to make this happen is that we as an HR function have to have a mindset shift in some ways, where we're no longer relying just on our ability to deliver the insights, to deliver the information, but we have to be willing to shift ownership of that. We have to get the line leaders more involved in the analysis of the data and the interpretation of it. And this is what I mean. When we looked at organizations, some organizations where HR came and said, here's what we found, here's what it means, this is what you should do, compared to those where they allowed the line leader to be effectively involved in the interpret interpretation of the data, they got much better results on that perspective. Secondly, when they're looking at what sort of solution set to go after, they were able to work more effectively with those line leaders to help them own the solution. And what you find there is that organizations that push some of that solution finding to the line actually got much better results as well. You know, there's this idea uh, in, that I struggle with with my own children, which is that if you tell them to do something, they very rarely do it. Right? If you've got kids and you give them some ideas, let them negotiate a little bit, make them feel like they've got some ownership of it, it's a whole lot easier to get, thing, get them to do things, right? So one way to think about it is that line leaders are sometimes like little children, okay? The more ownership and involvement that they feel in the process, the more likely that they are to take that information and make progress with it and do things with it. It's the exact same thing here. If we're pushing our solution set, pushing our information, pushing our analysis onto the line, the likelihood that they absorb it and use it is just much less. If we let them feel like they're involved in identifying the problem from the data, identifying what some of the solutions look like, they're much more likely to use that information, and then in turn, we're much more likely to get better results out of it. Seagate, the technology company located, uh, headquartered here in California, <clears throat> has actually taken this approach to a lot of detail. Uh, and what they found when you've got these sorts of situations, when you're letting the line become more involved, is that there's three things that tend to be hard about it. One, there's a lot of data that people have to consume quickly. That the idea of just dumping a big spreadsheet on people just doesn't work particularly well. Two, when they get that data, there's a sense of what do I actually do with it? And what a lot of people struggle with is this idea that if I work on this part of it or go in this way with it, then something bad will happen. Well, if I do this, it'll improve performance, but it's gonna hurt retention. If I do this, it'll drive retention, but hurt engagement or whatever it might be. And then three, once you have the information, most line leaders struggle with actually understanding what to do with it. So let me actually go back one step. So what Seagate's actually done a little bit differently is that they went through and rather than just providing information back, they have a whole set of visualization tools that their line leaders get full access to. And within these visualization tools, what you're able to do as a line leader is actually go through different scenarios. If we, are, if we do increase compensation based upon the modeling that we've got, how will that actually move the curves that are there? So they're really involved in the tools and resources themselves. This company has really not given up ownership, but has involved the line leader in the ownership of the data and the analysis that's there. It's a huge distinction that they've made to be successful. The second part of what Seagate's done here <clears throat> is not only do they let them visualize the data, they give them reports that come out of it to say, if you make this compensation increase, Yes, your retention could improve, but your labor cost three years from now will be Y percent higher, whatever the number is. So that gives them the full sense of the implications of what that looks like by pushing that out in more detail. Uh, and then finally, whenever they've actually gotten to a solution around something, let's say again, improving compensation, they actually then provide them the discussion guides, the communication materials, all of the budgeting and finance resources that go along with the implementation of that decision. So the key thing that they've done differently is rather than have analytics be an HR activity, it's an organization activity, and they get the line leaders much more involved in the process that's going on. So as we think about it, there's kind of three things that have really distinguished the organizations that have been the most effective at driving the analytic capability in their organization. One, they've got a better way to understand what are the business questions that are actually being asked, a way to get after that information. 
Two, rather than just being great at the, uh, the data science and the analytics part of it, they're also really good at the judgment part of it and understanding how to make decisions off the information that's there. And three, they've pushed much harder on the end user adoption and use of the analytics information that's there. And so the organizations that have done this, as I mentioned earlier, get, by doing this within their analytics space, have actually not only gotten more sophisticated with what they do, but they're actually much more applied with what they do. And those companies are the ones that have gotten about a 20% higher a return on the talent outcomes compared to those that don't. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to actually start to open it up for questions. Yeah. So if Josh and um, you guys want to pop up there, we can open it up, have some Q&A. So I thought these were some great presentations from some truly uh, top of mind industry experts on what's going on in our space of uh, HR <laughs> learning and talent. And they shared with you a lot of great data points around the trends that are taking place right now, some best practices, awesome examples, guys, by the way. So before we open it up, I want to say personally thank you, and let's give them a round of applause. Our excellent presentation. All right, so who in the audience has questions for these guys? We can just start taking them and see where we go with the dialogue. So we want to make sure we have enough time and effort for that. Yes? I feel like Phil Donahue here. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. Um, it would appear to me, based on trying to put together both of your presentations, that bridging the chasm would take a uh, decidedly human performance technology-centered approach, in, especially in today's multi-generational workplace, that you have now the tools able to get to what actually HR should be measuring in terms of business outcomes. So how can organizations, or have you seen where organizations, I think, Josh, again, the, many of the examples that you presented did this, but where social media and really embracing um, the fact that you've got a new generation, a, a new workplace, workforce coming into the, uh, the workplace that is uh, very communicative, to leverage that data to help define for business leaders, the CEOs, the C-suite, this is what a high performer does. And this is really what makes the difference in getting business done, such that HR is then influenced and saying, you know what, we're tracking the wrong thing. What we need to be listening to uh, what our high performers are taking or, or producing and telling us and, and letting HR do the right thing as far as measuring instead of transactionally, um, where a lot of, I think, HR analytics are stuck, uh, what really makes the dollar come in the door and, and listening to those Yeah, I, I would say the very simple answer I would have was sort of the same thing that Brian said, is don't start with the data, start with the problem. <clears throat> you can sit around all day and look at HR data and you might find something really interesting or you might not. But if you just go talk to the business leaders about what, if, and one of the companies I talked to told me this, they go to the, like it's a healthcare company, they go to the head of the hospital and say, what's the one thing you want me to work on? The one most important thing. He lists something, and maybe it's turnover, maybe it's whatever, you know, infections. They go back and they work on that. And that's, that, that's basically what Brian's research says too, is that, you know, maybe social data is interesting, maybe it's not, but it, it may not be relevant to the problem that your company is having. So if, if the analytics group focuses on that, chances are they're going to learn a lot from that project, and then they can do more and more and more. And I, and I think social data will eventually become a part of this, but most HR organizations aren't ready for that. <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I think one of the, what's going on with a lot of the social data right now is that we're, companies are doing analytics on the things that they can measure within that space which are not necessarily the things that are actually important. So um, if you look at just as, for example, like what drives performance today, uh, and compare that to 10 years ago, and to paint the extremes to make a point, if you're to look at 10 years ago, it was really defined about people doing their individual tasks and doing their job in front of them. Today, it's much more defined by the contribution that employees are making to not just their own job, but to everyone that they work with. It's become more collaborative, more interconnected, all those sorts of things. Now, if you use social data, what you could easily find is that the number of people that post the most on Chatter, or Yammer, or whatever internal social media platform that you've got are the people that are going to be the highest performance because it's more connected. But it's kind of like an activity-based measure of what's going on. But that activity doesn't necessarily map to the contributions that they're actually making. So if you've got social data that accurately captures the thing you care about, then I think there's a lot of opportunity with it. But to Josh's point, I think most of the social data out there doesn't yet 
get to the point where you're actively measuring what what matters and what's going on within the organization, I think it'll catch up at, at some point. The in, scary, in I mean, we were talking about this at the break. The scary thing is that there are vendors now that are looking at social data to predict retention. So for example, LinkedIn is doing this in a bunch of startups that are looking at whether you change your LinkedIn profile on what, what you're doing with it, and then they send the data to your employer and say, this guy's a flight risk. So there's all sorts of interesting new models of using social data for HR that we haven't even used yet. <laughs> so that's a scary one. But that's, I'm, I'm serious. This, this is, that's, a, that's a space. And I don't see why an employer wouldn't do it if they put their mind to it. They could do the same thing. Yeah. And, and it, there's the social data and behavioral data as well. Because one of the other things that's going on in terms of that next generation of data is that there's a lot of work that's being done at MIT where they're tracking you know, tone of voice, uh, all sorts of other characteristics, like how much people walk around, those sorts of things. And using that data to better understand leadership effectiveness, for example. Um, right now, there's a whole lot of things around the accuracy of that data. So like the LinkedIn example, did you update your LinkedIn profile because you finally got around to doing it? And you just haven't done it in a while? Or are you actually looking for another job elsewhere? You know, uh, But those things will be figured out at some point, And there'll be enough analysis around it. But it's for me the question is does that social and behavioral data is it accurately measuring the thing you want to measure or is it the only thing that you happen to be able to measure and that's a that's a, a big distinction between those two in most cases great good point so to take away here is we still need to focus on the core business problem and let the data drive what that problem is and also be careful when you update your LinkedIn profile <laughs> <laughs> so who else has got a question Surely there's more questions. <laughs> Hands, anyone? More questions? Yes. Back there. Uh, Robin, if you want to give the mic, did you have a question? No? Sorry about that. <laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot. Other questions? Might have a lot of people that want to get going here. John, sir, do you have a question right here? You? <laughs> He's doing email. It's formulating. Come on, you guys have to have something. Or stories you want to tell? Any, anybody want to share anything? Well, I, I do have a question, if you don't mind. I mean, if we're all here, if you guys don't mind my asking a question. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, you guys do a lot of research on big data and analytics and what we're doing with our field of, of HR and talent and learning. Um, say, we're, say we're back here a year from now, and you're sitting down. What would be, in your minds, the most uh, surprising things, if you could state maybe one or two? And then what would be the things that you completely expect to happen? If we were here, if I can take a little bit longer time horizon, so call yeah, it like three it, to five years. Yeah, make it like three to five years. Three to five years. I think, um, and to be a, a little bit extreme to make the point, uh, I think, you know, five years from now, the idea of a big employee survey will be dead. Um, I think when you when you really look at, you know, what's going on within that space, um, you know, you, you do a big survey about someone's experiences across the last year. By the time you get the data and analyze the data and action plan against it, another six months have gone by. So you're looking at information that's 18 months old. And, and I don't know about you guys, but most companies 18 months from now are going to look really different than they do today for a variety of reasons. Then the other thing that's really interesting about that, that but, but there's some new work that's showing, is the things that can influence thing, your, your response to a survey on an engagement level are things like, did you have a long commute? Did you get in a fight with your spouse? Did you, um, uh, did you spill coffee on yourself this morning? And a lot of those factors in the moment have a bigger impact on uh, someone's engagement level, as a, a for example. What, people, what companies are starting to find is that the idea of a continuous measurement rather than an interval-based me measurement are going to become much more effective. And it's going to be understanding the, the trend and how things are moving up and, and fluctuating on a day-to-day -day basis. So like a company like Sears, uh, they've gone away from a big employee survey, and what you do at the end of the day when you're in a you work for Sears, when you clock out, you just answer a question like, "How was your day?" Basically, one to ten. It's a net promoter score type question, and then what they're able to do there is look at the trends that are going on. So if they start to see something declining, you know, a couple weeks in a row, then they have an intervention. So they've gone away from big, huge survey stuff to more in the moment, real time. Some of that's still going to come from a survey, from you know those sorts of things. So caution a little bit on the extremism, but um, there's going to be so many other sources of data and information about what employees are doing that provide a real-time measure rather than a big one-off measure. 
And I think as people figure that out and learn that out, both how to collect it, analyze it, report it, understand what it means, I think that'll be one of the biggest shifts across the next three to five years. So, so the biggest thing when we get to Josh would be you're saying do more of like a pulse-like survey as you go along, which is more in the moment, uh, shorter, more concise. You're getting data on a continual basis versus a more lengthy survey at mm -hmm. any point in time. And I think your second takeaway was don't have people fill them out when they spill hot coffee on their <laughs> lands. Right. So, Josh, what's your thoughts on this? So, well? I, I have one that, so five years from now, you know what the quantified self movement is? Is anybody into that? If you're a bike rider, exercise, you, it's, you know, I, I use this thing, this, this thing when I go bike riding. I can't, I would not be surprised if we look back if five years from now, we are getting data about heart rate of our employees, where they are, how many steps they went up today, how many times they spent in meetings with their friends versus versus with their other outside of their organization. We're going to have this stream of data about people that is going to be location, um, all sorts of things that, that we, we know, we're kind of starting to see today. And some of that's going to be available to HR, and HR is going to start looking at it. Um, and I, I totally agree with Brian. This, this idea of retention versus an engagement survey, I kind of think, that to me, the engagement survey industry is kind of a little bit of an old-fashioned industry, and it needs to sort of reinvent itself. Uh, but that kind of data is going to be out there. And, and, you know, I live here in the Bay Area, so I'm around all these startups, so I see this stuff all the time. But, you know, look at the cars. I mean, I don't know if any of you have, you know, relatively new cars, how much data is capturing the, capturing the cars. I just found out this morning when I was at the gym that Ford is capturing every location. When you put buy a new Ford, is there anybody from Ford in here before I get in trouble? They know where their cars are, and they have a data, they have a historical track record of where you've been and what you've done to your car. Now, they inadvertently let out that they have that data, and there was a whole bunch of you know, controversy about what they're going to do with it. And then they kind of backpedaled and said, well, we're really not looking at it. It's just sitting there. But <laughs> you know, we got so many electronic devices, they're all capturing data. So I, I think within five years, we're gonna, that stuff's going to be part of this whole analytics thing. Yeah. And, and we'll be using it for something. I'm not sure what. There, there's also another interesting <laughs> piece to that, which is not just the um, heart rate, those sorts of things. But if you also look at the evolution of a lot of the brain imaging capability that's occurring, and the understanding of the human brain, that that at some point will make a huge leap as well. Maybe that's probably like the five to seven year time horizon. But a lot of the neuroscience research that's going on right now is able to identify based on people's brain imaging who's more of a narcissist than other people and all those sorts of characteristics. Now, you, it, it's not completely unfathomable to think that uh, as part of a recruiting or selection process or as a high potential you go selection a process PET scan or something that it, it's the, the technology the, the technology is, is going to be there to be able to do it now it's a question of how does that manifest within what we do from HR perspective from privacy all those well that's the other thing is you know we haven't even started to grapple with the privacy issues of all this data I mean, I mean I think most HR organizations are conservative but some are not and mm -hmm. some of them are going to take this data and use it and and so that's going to be a a little space of itself that's going to grow up as to, as to who owns all this information. <clears throat> great, great question.